Well, welcome back. And in today's video, we're going to look in more detail at one of the key factors of water um, or the properties of water that make it quite unique and useful on our planet, and that's its high heat capacity. Okay, so we're going to be better defining heat capacity and looking at some, some ways to um, calculate the amount of energy based on a change in temperature. So let's get going. So as we said before, water has a really high heat capacity. What this means is it takes a lot of energy to increase the temperature of water. And you will have seen this on a hot day at the beach where you may head down to the um, head down to the beach, you walk across the sand and your feet get really, really hot. They feel like they're burning, but you run into the water and it feels much cooler. This is because of heat capacity. Both the sand and the water have been receiving the same amount of energy from the sun, but the sand has raised its temperature to a much higher degree than the water. And this is because it has a lower heat capacity. It can hold on to the energy. Um, it can't hold on to the energy as well without changing temperature. So that increase in energy is passed on to the um, substance as an increase in kinetic energy, which we see as heat. In the terms of water, we have a high amount of hydrogen bonding. So the increased kinetic energy breaks these hydrogen bonds without increasing the kinetic energy of the molecules. So we don't see an overall average increase in temperature for quite some time. So the specific heat capacity is defined as the amount of heat energy needed to increase the temperature of a certain mass, so one gram in chemistry is what we use, of a substance by one degree C. Okay, so this is the definition that you need to know. If you do physics, sometimes they will use um, one kilogram of substance by one degree, um, which changes the energy calculations that we will use to kilojoules, whereas in chemistry we do stick to this one gram. Okay, so this means that um, each substance will have a unique specific heat capacity, okay, depending on how easy it is to make one gram go up by one degree. For water, um, this is given in your constant or your data book as 4.2 joules, which is our unit of energy per gram per degree C. Okay, um, you'll sometimes see it as 4.18, but in your data booklet it's written at 4.2. So the higher the specific heat capacity, the more effective the substance will be at storing energy, i.e. it can take in more energy before changing temperature. The equation that we use for this is that the heat energy is going to be equal to the specific heat capacity of the substance multiplied by the mass of the substance, and this is always the mass that is changing temperature, multiplied by the change in temperature. Okay, has it gone up, has it gone down, by what magnitude? If we compare the effect of different heat capacities, we can do this quite easily by comparing different liquids. One is ethane diol, okay, which hopefully you might be able to remember the structure. If we've got a diol, we actually have two hydroxyls. So this is going to be ethane diol, okay and water. Now if we look at these, both of these will be able to um, form hydrogen bonds, but remember we said that water forms a large number of hydrogen bonds in proportion to its size. So while ethane diol can form hydrogen bonds, we can see that its specific heat capacity is actually less than water. As the energy is increasing, we can see that ethane diol's temperature is increasing, okay, um, at a greater rate the water's temperature is increasing, okay. So per gram of ethane diol we will actually have less hydrogen bonds in the substance than per gram of water because of water's unique ability to form four hydrogen bonds per molecule. It's going to have a much smaller molar mass, so we'll have more molecules of water in the same volume than we would of ethane diol. So we have more hydrogen bonds to overcome, so therefore it will absorb more energy. 
So the heat capacities of different substances vary greatly, and this is a picture from your textbook. Okay, and if you have a look, we can see that iron is 0 0.45, copper is 0 0.39, aluminium is also less than 1 at 0 0.9, water is at 4.18 or 4.2, ethane diol, which we use as antifreeze, is 2.42. Okay, so still quite high compared to the other ones that we're looking at. Chlorofluorocarbons, which were used as refrigerants, is 0 0.6. Glass is 0 0.8, and things like that. Have a think and see, can you make some general assumptions regarding the bonding in these compared to their heat capacity? Okay, and I want you to write that down in your notes, and we'll talk about it when we come to class. So as I said, once we've defined what heat capacity is, one of the things that we will see this for is it being used in calculations. Okay, so if, um, we'll be asked to do things like calculate the energy required to increase the temperature of one kilogram of water by 10 degrees C. So this is the equation that we saw before, Q is equal to MC delta T, where Q is equal to heat energy, mass must be in grams. So if this is the case, I want to work out the heat energy. The mass is going to be one kilogram, so I'm going to convert that to grams, which will be 1,000. Okay, I'm going to multiply by a specific heat capacity, which is 4.2 for water. And then I'm going to multiply by the change in temperature because it wants me to increase the temperature by 10 degrees. 10 is going to be my... Um, change in temperature. So I'm going to get 1000 and I'm going to multiply by 4.2 and multiply by 10. So I'm going to get 42,000 and then it's going to be joules. Okay, once I have this I can convert into a more reasonable unit to give it two significant figures which is going to be 42 kilojoules. Okay, so it will take 42 kilojoules of energy to increase just one kilo of water by 10 degrees. If we look at um, the same thing for sand, so this time we're going to look at energy required for one kilogram, so 1,000 grams of sand, and this is going to now be 0 0.48 by the same temperature change. Okay, we can see that it's going to be 1, 2, 3, multiply by 4.2, multiplied by 10 is now going to be, it's going to be 10 times less. So it's only going to take 4,200 joules or 4.2 kilojoules in order to increase the amount of sand by the same amount. Okay, um, so here we've used 1,000. It is best if you can use 0 0.997 grams per mil when talking about water. This comes from the idea that density is equal to mass divided by volume. Okay, so it's 0 0.997 grams per liter, uh, per milliliter, which makes it 99.7 grams per um, 100 mils. Okay, this is a recent change in VCAR and you're better off using this now right from the start rather than rounding up to one which I've done here to um, <laughs> make it easier for me in this case. So let's have a look at another question. In this question we're told that a beaker contains 100 milliliters of water Okay, is heated using a Bunsen burner over a period of 10 minutes. The temperature of the water increases from 15 degrees to 80 degrees. Determine the heat energy of the water in the beaker. So we're going to use the same equation, Q equals MC delta T, M cap. To use the mass, we're going to consider the density of water, which is 0 0.997 grams per mil. Okay. We can round to 1 in year 11. So the same numerical value can be used for the mass of water in grams as given for the volume. And that should say milliliters. Okay, so mass is going to be 100 grams. Our heat capacity, this one's using 4.18, which is going to be 4.2, depending on what data table you're looking at. Delta T is going to be our final temperature, which is 80, which is what it got to, minus where we started at 15 is 65 degrees C. Substitute all those into our equation, and we will get 27,170 joules, 
um, we should have three significant figures for this one because we have three significant figures in each of the values we're using in our calculations. So 27.1 kilojoules. Let's look at one more question. So if we use the same Bunsen burner using to heat a 500 gram sample, okay, so we're told the mass this time and it's of copper for 10 minutes, okay, time doesn't come into my equation, so all I need to know is that essentially it's been heated for the same time. So we assume the same amount of energy is transferred into the Bunsen burner, okay, so we're going to get this from the previous question. Um, determine the highest temperature that the block of copper could reach. Okay, so we're going to be looking for delta T in this case, okay, and then adding that to our original is going to give me the final temperature. Okay, we have been given the specific heat capacity, so I'm going to use Q equals MC delta T, and then I'm going to be looking at my mass, okay, which was given from the question. Okay, specific heat capacity also given from the question, and this is from the previous question. Remembering that we've got to take it in joules when using this formula must be, okay, Q must be in joules, okay. So then when we rearrange, so we're going to get delta T is going to be equal to Q divided by MC and we will get 140 degrees. Remembering that it says the final temperature, so we're going to take our initial temperature, add our change in temperature to get that the piece of copper will reach 155 degrees C in contrast to the border which only reached 80. Okay, so that's how we calculate heat energy using the property of specific heat capacity which is intrinsic to each substance that we look at. Okay. So the high heat capacity of water is one of the reasons that we see it present in all three states on our planet, which is one of the only substances found as a liquid, solid and gas. Okay, It's predominantly in the liquid phase over the temperature range found on Earth, our oceans and our rivers, which help to regulate the temperature of our planet. Okay, That huge body of water adds as a works as a giant heat sink, regulating the temperature and weather on our planet. Okay, so now I want you to summarize your notes on heat capacity based on this video and your textbook readings, okay, and then work on these textbook questions to consolidate your knowledge on using heat capacity formulas for calculating the amount of energy, and I'll see you in class.